other thing is intubation. The other thing we do is put, basically put in a breathing tube into your trachea so you can help your lungs breathe, which brings oxygen to the rest of your tissues. Uh, this isn't as important as we used to think it was, uh, so now this is kind of being downplayed. Uh, this is where we talk about putting on life support. So if we do this, then we put someone, and we do get their heart back, we basically put them on a ventilator. That ventilator is breathing for you. We have to sedate someone and not sometimes paralyze someone in order to do this type of thing, if they're already not sedated uh, to begin with. Um, now the other options that we have are basically with a bag valve mask or something called um, CPAP or BiPAP. These are things that we will do sometimes if someone doesn't want to be intubated. So we have a lot of patients with chronic lung problems that have been intubated, and it's a very frightening experience. Uh, you have a tube in there, you're usually you're sedated or you're kind of out of it, um, and it's not easy to have a machine pushing lung, you know, air into your lungs, kind of working with that. Uh, so some patients will say, I don't want to be intubated, you know, so these are the things we can try. The other one, the one on the right is actually something that is very useful. It doesn't involve a tube, you have to be awake. It is a machine that pushes air in as you breathe in and kind of helps keep your lungs open as you breathe out. Uh, it's been something that's been kind of recently, in the last probably 10 years we're using, it, so we don't have to intubate patients. Um, the intubations itself, you can get into pneumonia, you can get into issues of, you know, now they're on life support, should I take them off life support? It's very difficult for families to make that decision sometimes if they haven't had conversations before. Um, and other things we do is we give medications. Um, sometimes we'll push, as we're coding someone doing CPR, we're basically pushing on a pump. We're giving medications to help see if we can get the heart to restart. Um, in order to give those medications, we have to be doing the CPR. So, Sometimes we'll see patients where they want the medications, but they don't want the CPR, which basically means that the medication is not going to get to the heart. Uh, other things we'll do is we'll pay, put patients on medications to raise their blood pressure. Uh, if you're, uh, oh, you've got blood loss, or if you're having a huge infection and your blood pressure drops, these are medications that will kind of help bring it up so you can get blood to your tissues, things like that. Uh, so there's other things to consider, you know, do I want this or do I not want this? Do I, want the you know disease to kind of progress on its own and, and going from there. Um, this usually requires that we put a central line, which is a larger line, into someone's neck uh, or into their chest area, which is a little more dangerous than just doing something into your you know your arm or regular IV. Uh, it does involve a little more of a procedure and it has com complications itself too. Some of the other newer things we're doing uh, for patients is something called hypothermia. So we're basically chilling someone down. We're not freezing them. We're kind of lowering their body temperature. We think this helps uh, for, you know, if you've got already good brain function, you have a sudden heart attack, um, this has a small, slight chance of helping you as far as recovery. So this is some of the new things. It's actually quite simple. Uh, we do this quite often. We'll actually put ice bags under your armpits, around someone's neck and their groin area, put them on a cooling blanket, and try to bring down their temperature. Um, I've had a couple successes. We have usually they're younger patients that will kind of get, you know, basically I had a young girl who had a heart arrhythmia and we were able to get the point where she got, we brought her back and she was able to walk out of the hospital in a couple days, which was pretty good. Um, the other thing that we're doing now is something called uh, working on sepsis. Sepsis is basically just a huge infection. So it could be pneumonia, it could be bladder infections. It basically means that your body's being overwhelmed. Um, there's a big push now, uh, which, you know, has its plus, you know, be benefits and, um, and it also has some risk too involved that we're kind of actually getting better at treating this. So at the one hospital in San Pedro, we've increased our, we've decreased our mortality rate. So about 50% of patients with this would die. Now it's under 25%. Now that's good if you're young and healthy and you can go back out there and you know, live the rest of your life. But if you're gonna go back to a nursing home, end up getting another infection because you've got cat employee catheters in, you're intubated. It's kind of a revolving door in some situations. So it's not as helpful, uh, something else to consider as far as do you want these methods and some of these aggressive things to be done. Uh, also blood products, we give this a lot of times if you've lost blood. Also if you're already anemic, this helps you kind of give, it's kind of along the same lines with the sepsis, helps you recover from, from types of from things. Um, and then this is just kind of considerations, like Sister Katie was saying, you know, these are aggressive measures. 100 years ago we didn't have any of these options. Um, they used to do CPR, they would actually hang someone over a horse and run the horse around the town and see if that would kind of bring back their heart. Um, were some of the early uh, attempts at doing this type of stuff. Uh, so basically the question and something that you're able to participate at this point, and the good thing is everyone's here, considering this is how do I want to die? We have choices, you can go through, um, uh, Duval's gonna talk about advanced directives, things like that, choices that you can make now, saying that this is the situation that I would, if I'm in this situation, do I want to live, live this way or not live it this way? Uh, the thing to consider is kind of, what I tell patients is your quality of life. You know, I don't, I've told my wife too, I don't, if I end up intubated um, in the hospital, cannot 
you know, communicate or talk or anything. I don't want that. That's not the way I want to live the rest of my life. So those are things we discuss. Other people are just afraid to die, and sometimes they have the rights to say, "Look, I don't, I don't, you know, I want to try to continue on as much as I can," um, which is difficult too. Uh, also, what Sister Kay was talking about is just kind of your dignity, dignity in your death. Um, hospice is a great program. I've had you know, good experience with family members. Um, it's also I've had good experience with patients. Um, it's also something that kind of brings back some of that dignity to death. It's hard to die in a hospital bed. Uh, most people would like to, would prefer to die at home with their family around. Those are things to kind of consider uh, when making some of these decisions. Um, as far as going along with hospice, uh, there's a lot of palliative care hospice programs. Um, they do great things. There's the one thing that they're kind of just pushing for is just treating patients' pain. Uh, most patients with terminal cancer are suffering from pain. Uh, there, there's now a push. It's hard for, as a physician, to give a lot of pain medications to patients because we see that you know, we're worried about addiction, we're worried about them not breathing. Um, now there's, there's doctors that spe kind of specialize in palliative care that are much better able to treat this. They're not as afraid to do this. In the ER, we're always concerned if I give someone this pain medication, it might drop their blood pressure, make them worse. Uh, but in someone who's you know, terminal cancer patient and dying, uh, it's actually much more beneficial. Uh, the other thing is there's other medications, things to do for anxiety, uh, other things that we worry about end of life, is nausea, anorexia, those are things uh, that, that can be treated or not really treated, but helped for the patient. Uh, also, shortness of breath, uh, like I was saying, patients that have a lot of lung problems, it's very scary to be short of breath. It's one of the most scariest things I've ever seen on a patient's face is when they can't breathe. Uh, so those are things that you know, they can, we can help treat, we can help kind of with some of the suffering. The big push is you know, trying to reduce suffering Kind of comfort the patient. Also, not to forget about the family because the family is going through the same process as well. It's a loss. Uh, it's something else. The hospice is very good about doing that, that type of uh, intervention and care too. Um, so. And then we've all this kind of a solemn talk, so I wanted to bring back something just to think about life and living. Um, so the, basically, the question: If we were thinking about how we're going to die, we also want to think about how we're living our life. Uh, we want to live our life to the fullest. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Mother Teresa. It says, uh, life is an opportunity, benefit from, from it. Life is beauty, admire it. Life is a dream, realize it. Life is a challenge, meet it. Life is a duty, complete it. Life is a game, play it. Life is a promise, fulfill it. Life is sorrow, overcome it. Life is a song, sing it. Uh, life is a struggle, accept it. Life is a tragedy, confront it. Life is an adventure, dare it. Life is luck, make it. Life is too precious. Do not destroy it. Life is life. Fight for it. And also one from Gandhi is, uh, where there's love, there's life. So I just want to kind of leave you with those thoughts. It's kind of a sad sad uh, topic for today, but we also want to consider you know, that everyone here is alive and live, live the rest of your life. Okay.